the other point is like facilitation um, under um, in a psychedelic session should a coach be able to or be allowed to facilitate a psychedelic experience you, you also um, mentioned that or, or, or put on that and uh, in the paper we we said um, the critical point is that the coach first and foremost um, it's not um, that it's not illegal what there has been done been done uh, like from the from the country that that it um, it happens in but also um, the the criti the second most critical point is that there is no intervention from the coach when the coachee is under the influence of a psychedelic substance uh, maybe we can discuss that a bit yeah. because there's also like there are uh, voices that say okay but what about mdma sessions yeah yeah let's, uh, to let's be an exception let's let's talk about so that like right because sessions yeah yeah I, because yeah. There, there was something inside the group as well because uh, nigel for example sits with people um uh, through psychedelic experiences i came in with well there shouldn't be any intervention and actually when the coach is present it's it can be tricky because the client might want to start talking about stuff while they are still uh, under the influence and while they're under the influence well they're considered vulnerable right because they're so open and so malleable the brain plasticity is high as you mentioned Nigel um, but I, uh, uh, Marcel but uh, Nigel it was really important for you to put that element in and we did include in the paper the coach as sitter right not just preparation and integration microdosing there was a note on it uh, we could write a lot more about it but we know relatively little but what about the coach as sitter because we know from within the community there's many many coaches who are also present during the experience and there's benefits and pitfalls with it right so when i say don't coach anybody during an experience i'm saying don't intervene in their experience and i think that's also something that nigel subscribes to right but like uh, if you're there during the experience, there's so much more that you can pick up on during the integration work. And the basic question is, what is intervention? Where yeah. does it begin? Where does it end? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because sometimes like when you're in a session, an intervention is already like taking a hand when the, yeah. the client needs a hand or just some support. So and how far do you influence the journey of the person by doing that and going into patterns or feeding patterns that they already have, etc. Or like only how you um, design the room. So maybe there are objects they are very clinging to or they have an aversion to. So how does that influence? already the journey the journey up front so i think nigel and, and i we are very much on the same path also with like facilitating guiding and for me it's also always the question of where does it start what is coaching then and mm -hmm. maybe the other idea of how important is it to your clients that they know how blurry the lines are or is it just like i need help i don't have an a, a diagnose so I don't get therapy I look for something else but is it for them important that you have very clear that's coaching that's mentoring that's maybe sort of therapy so what's your experience on that yeah I think that's a really important point and I think it really comes down to the agency of the client in this and establishing that very early on in the coach coachy or guide guidey relationship as to what this is and what it isn't uh, and being clear from the perspective of the coaching guide what it is you offer and be very, very upfront about what that is and what it isn't. And then that goes into the hands of the person who's making the decision to walk with you on this path or not. And they can, they can take the decision whether that's what, what they want. I feel that's a really important component. So there is clarity that from me, you will get this and you won't get that or for me you will get this and this and this and this is how i work uh, and then you build that relationship together uh, and i find when you're going into such states of especially if you are guiding at the same time or facilitating the, yeah, the coaching relationship in all in all cases is a very intimate one let's say but then when you're going into this level when you're 
guiding people through let's say heightened states of consciousness you're going into extreme positions of, of vulnerability that the um the the the, the, the approach that you, you that you use has to be yeah very very clear um and I've lost my train of thought totally where I was going with this, so I think I'm going to stop. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> happy to, I'm happy to jump in there <laughs> because you just put a lot of thoughts up, right? Um, the, for me, um, being part of the experience, I mean, I think it shows here that I come from coaching first and foremost. And I've had some psychedelic experiences, but like that was never in my professional conscious realm. Uh, so I've been a coach first and then I step professionally into psychedelics. Uh, I don't spend most of my life in that world. Um, and about at, probably at least half, probably more than half of the guests we had on the podcast come from the psychedelic field first and then they add coaching skills into that. So it, it makes sense that more of the people who come from that world would want to also hold that space during the experience. So me coming from coaching first and foremost, I, I draw quite clear lines there. You know, there's coaching skills that I would not apply during the experience. I, I think that's unethical. You know, I can't say I'm not tempted to see, you know, because some of the conversations I've had during an experience, you know, a couple of hours, a good couple of hours in, it's already beyond peak. And some of these conversations I've had with people really, really changed something for me. And part of that was their opinions or their questions or their guidance in some way. And I, I can't help but wonder what would have happened if that person was a professional coach who's not tripping, who's aware of their assumptions and projections and transference and emotions and committed to not guiding me or not judging me or not you know, influencing where my thinking is going other than, you know, um, facilitating that my thinking is going somewhere, uh, but not attached to where it's going. Um, so if that wasn't a friend of mine, but someone who's a professional, well-trained in those things, I mean, I can imagine that to be profoundly valuable. But at the moment where we're at now professionally, I think that's risky to say the least. So uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there. Um, so, but there's being with someone, but making a clear distinction between that's me as a person holding space for you to have an experience, and this is me as a professional coach helping you advancing your thinking or integrating these experiences, mm -hmm. or how, in practical terms, can I take these insights that I've had? and build them into new habits or build them into how I change my life now. How do I navigate my career? How do I navigate my relationships? Now that something profound seems to have shifted. You know, it really pained me to see so many people having an experience and profound shifts in consciousness, profound insights and learnings. And then six weeks later, they fall all into their old patterns. Mm. And this is where I think the um, in the beginning, the most valuable point for, to apply coaching is to take those insights and really integrate them into practical ways into how you live your life and work your work, you know, whatever you want to use it for. But during the experience, that's why I'm kind of put some distance because I think when you're holding an experience like that, there's another set of skills that you need. Um, there's some overlap, of course, but, mm. you know, I, I would want to have a lot more training and a lot more experience holding space for people's experiences. And for me, I'm just at the moment not interested in, um, and I don't have the time <laughs> to, to go through all of that process. So I concentrate on what I'm best at, which is the coaching part. Um, yeah. So I, I'm happy to be around the experience so that somebody knows, oh, my coach is kind of close and there's, I can have the conversation once the, once the experience has uh, faded out. Um, but yeah, many coaches hold space, you know, and that's the conversation that I also want to have. Uh, coaches, what, what are you doing when you're holding space? Are you coaching or are you a coach who's at the moment acting as sitter? You know, mm. where's, where's the line? Is, is that also very blurry? Because in reality, I think it could get very blurry and then it gets very complex. So at the moment, early steps, I, I make the, a clear distinction there. I like what you brought up there. You said about kind of going around the experience. So what you do is going around. And then you've also got then people who maybe do the entire line. So those that also have that role of coach and sitter or guide. 
And I think if you're doing this one, then also you as the person responsible, you have to maybe be wearing very much having the distinction between the hats you're wearing. So when you are doing your coaching element, you're doing the bit that's around. But when you're in the middle of the, of, the, of the line, so when you're actually in the psychedelic experience, you are there as a space holder and a facilitator and you're not, and you aren't coaching. You're holding the space. So if even people, if people are verbal, you're just holding that space for that enable for the enablement of that exchange but you're not having that interchange the exchange that you maybe would be having if you're at the bit that goes around so the uh, the preparation or, or the integration